I want you to reach for your Bibles and remain standing, please, and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number six. We're continuing a collection of talks called The Physician's Perspective. Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts, with some way John getting in between them too. It's volume one, volume two. And I want to pick up today in chapter number six and verse number one. If you have it, say amen. Okay. Verse number one. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of, say it with me, discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being, say it with me, discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the Word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the Word. Everyone liked this idea. And they chose the following, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timian, Parmenius, and Nicholas of Antioch, an early convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers said with me, greatly increased in Jerusalem. And many of the Jewish priests were converted to. Somebody say amen the reading of God's word. Amen. Father, we thank you. God, may we learn from you today and listen to what the Spirit is saying. And then may we apply it to our lives in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. This past weekend, for Labor Day weekend, we had the staff and their families come over and hang out, some food, and then also uh, just a little swimming time for the kids. And we had a lifeguard that we brought in, uh, Addie, who goes to our church, one of our high schoolers. And she was watching the pool, uh, monitoring the kids. My grandson was one of them in the pool who just turned four years of age and just really learned how to swim adequately this summer. And she sees him and thinks that he is struggling to survive and that he is drowning. So she jumps in and gets him and gets him to the side and rescues him. And we're very appreciative of Addie jumping in. But the truth of the matter is, uh, Shepherd looks like he's drowning all the time when he's swimming. <laughs> and she learned real quick, but we would rather her lean on the side of safety than not. <laughs> what I've learned is that life is a struggle in everything. Whatever it is that you do, the question is, are you struggling to survive or are you struggling to thrive? And what you find in the book of Acts chapter six is the church of Jesus Christ is introduced to one of their struggles. And it would be a crucial, on how they handle this, determination, is it just gonna be a church that's struggling to survive or a church that's struggling to thrive? I've got two questions for you today that we're gonna address is one, what are some of the struggles that we face as a church today that are very similar to what they faced? And then secondly, how can we thrive through the struggles. So first, what are some of the struggles that we face today that were very similar to what they faced back then? One is the struggle from within. Is the very real struggle from within. What you have here in this text that we just read is that the Hellenistic Jews or the Greek-speaking Jews had a struggle with the more traditional Hebrew-speaking Jews. They were feeling discontent and discriminated against in the taking care of their widows. And that's a very real problem. It's a very real issue. And what you gotta understand is that these Greek-speaking Jews were probably individuals who had lived outside of Jerusalem in the Roman world somewhere and was eventually coming back into Jerusalem because they wanted to be back to their home front, their faith. But yet, 
they had picked up a lot of the culture that the Greeks had, and they weren't really welcomed like they probably should have been by the Hebrew-speaking, more traditional Jews. And so there is tension going on there. Which brings me to think about this, is that just because we are Christians does not mean that there will be no differences among us. But the question we must address as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is this. Will we be committed to listening to each other, working through issues, and practicing forgiveness and love? And if we can answer with an affirmative yes and follow up with that yes, with actual practicing of it, then we will be a church that can thrive through the struggles that we will face. And there were seven men helped to pick. I mean, they picked to be able to help navigate through this struggle that they're going on. And there's things that they represented that I feel like we as individual followers of Jesus must represent if we're going to be a church that's thriving in the midst of the struggles that we face. It's first, they were willing to serve. You see, God is not looking for people of ability. He's looking for people who are available. That's what he needs. He doesn't need your talent. He needs you willing to give your time and say, here am I, God, use me. Also, they were well-respected and responsible people. Somebody that they could depend on. Let us be Christians who practice what we preach. Wherever we go, whatever we do, and when we say something that we'll actually do what we say we are going to do. We can be counted on to follow through and be who we say we are and represent Christ in a way. May we also be people that are full of wisdom, full of wisdom. I have learned over time that common sense is not so common. <laughs> but I got hope for all of you, including me, is the book of James chapter one says that if you lack wisdom to ask your father above and he will give that wisdom to you and that we have not because we ask not. And sometimes we ask for things and we ask amiss for our own lustful desires and wants instead of what God wants for us. And also we need to be people full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. And how do you measure people that are full of the Holy Spirit? Let me give you two ways. One, the gifts of the Spirit. When you see them operate in the gifts of the Spirit, that is a sign of being full of the Holy Spirit. But let me just be very also quick to stop and say, just because they're operating in gifts does not mean that they're always full of the Spirit. Because the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And sometimes you can have gifts that are used that have been given by the Holy Spirit, but yet you are not walking in the fruit of the Spirit. Because the greater measure of being full of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. So let's be quick, not be so quick to focus on the gifts and be more focused and in tune on guarding, uh, cultivating and nurturing the garden of our life where the fruit is developed. Because let me tell you, whatever fruit that is, whether it's love, joy, or peace, or self-control, or patience, whatever that is, is that what I had yesterday in fruit will not do me for today. That each day I've got to invite the presence of God in my life to produce new fresh fruit that I can pick from to use for the situation that I'm facing today in my life. That's what we must have. Somebody say amen in Guthrie. Somebody say amen in Oklahoma City. And then also, they were dealing with, which we're going to have to deal with too, not just the struggle from within, but the struggle from without. Let me just talk about the struggle from without. You see, the devil hates a church that refuses to be divided and who is willing to push back darkness at any cost. Are you hearing me? And when the church finds individuals and he finds people that will collectively do that, it makes him angry. He is happy with the church that is complacent. He is happy with individual Christians that are comfortable in your Christianity. He is not happy with those that are willing to stand united around God's word in the central truth of the claims of Jesus Christ and are willing to push back darkness at all costs. He doesn't like that. And so he unleashes persecution. Look at Acts chapter eight and verse one. It says a great wave of persecution began that day sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. 
In chapter number six at the end, and also chapter number seven is the first martyr of the church. His name is what? Stephen. Stephen is the first martyr. And it launches this incredible persecution against the church. There will be increased spiritual warfare where the gospel is preached and lived out. Did you hear me? There will be increased spiritual warfare where the gospel is preached and lived out. So in other words, if you take the gospel to your local place of work, there is going to be resistance by the evil one to come against you. Even individuals who are just not really knowing can be unknowingly used by the enemy to push back against what God is wanting to do. It happens every time. And as a church, as we preach the gospel and take it to the world, the devil is going to come against us with everything he can. But the history of the persecution against the church has never turned out good for the devil. He loses every time. Because when he turns up the heat, real Christians rise up and stand firm, willing to face the furnace to see what God will do. Amen? Amen. Why is that? Because Jesus said this. He said, I will build my church and the gates of what? Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So in other words, when Christians are walking with Christ, when the devil fights against, you got Jesus Christ that has proclaimed that his church is going to move forward. Amen. So you got the struggle from within, you got the struggle from without, and then also you got the struggle for diversity, the struggle for diversity and diversity doesn't happen by chance. And when I use that word diversity, let me just say, I'm talking about variety. A Jewish man's prayer some 2000 years ago would have been something like this. A religious Jewish man's prayer some 2000 years ago. Okay. Maybe not for all, but for many would have been something like this. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe, who has not created me a Gentile, a slave, a beast, or a woman. Is that settled in for just a moment? Because there was a sense of pride in the identity of who they were that was misguided from what God had created them to be. The Jewish people were meant to be a lot to the world not a place that says we are unto our own and you cannot be like us or you're not as good as us. In the book of Matthew chapter number 28, Jesus gives his final commission to the church to go into all the world before he goes to heaven and take this good news to the gospel of the gospel. Where? To Jerusalem, but don't stop there. To Samaria, to Judea, and to where? The ends of the earth. Go everywhere. And so you have this happening in Acts chapter two, where they are endued with power from on high. But then we started reading our text today from Matthew, um, from Acts chapter number six. So Acts chapter two, the spirit is outpoured. Acts chapter six, you've got the difficulty that's happening among them. And what has the church done to this point? Not a whole lot. They've stayed close by. And this has been three to six years since Acts chapter number two. And so what happens? There is a wave of persecution. Sometimes God will use persecution to get our attention. And here's what happens to Philip. Philip, you'll see on the map behind me, begins to go. He goes first to Samaria. And I think Philip probably understood a little bit of what it's like to be discriminated against. He understood that a little bit because he was one of those Greek-speaking Jews that felt the pushback from the Hebrew-speaking Jews. And so when God turns on that light from him and he realized, no, it's not just about us. We got to go out. He goes to Samaria first and experiences a mighty revival there. And then God speaks to him and he goes all the way to Gaza. Those are very crucial towns, even in today's context. And there he meets an Ethiopian eunuch who he shares the gospel with. And then he goes up to Caesarea. He begins to go around to the places where Jesus had went and Jesus had proclaimed hope to. You see, when Jesus taught, he taught things that blew people's mind because it opened up to people that weren't like them. It wasn't just for the Jewish speaking and the, and, and the Jewish flavored world. It was for people unlike them. Because that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, diversity is God's idea, not yours. And diversity is not a cultural thing as it's defined it, but is as God's defined diversity. And you go all the way back to the beginning, God created everything. He, I, I would say if you look at his creation, he was a very diverse-minded 
thinking person or God as he is creating everything. Does that make sense? And as he creates things, he finally makes man. And man, he makes. And everything else, he said, it is very good. And when he makes man, male, and he makes him out of the dust of the ground, he looks and said, it is what? Good. He didn't say very good. Because he realized there's something missing. It was the diversity. And then he creates woman. And then God says what? It is very good. Come on, how many of you men know that? <laughs> and women, you gotta embrace that. And it was about diversity. And out of those two individuals came every skin tone, everything throughout the world. Because God values people. He values every person. It doesn't matter what we look like on the outside or what continent we come from. God says, I love them because I created them in my image. And as pastor, I want to say thank you to every single person that comes to this church that doesn't look exactly like me, that doesn't have the same skin tone. Because in a time and an age where the church really is a very much segregated and it's not a very diverse place, I rejoice in North Church being a diverse place because you have chosen to trust me. And I want to stir that trust wisely because we want to represent heaven because I want to get to heaven someday and it not be out of, I won't feel uncomfortable when I look around and see the rest of the world worship in with me. Amen. Then also the struggle with within, the struggle without, the struggle for diversity, but then also there's the struggle for the next generation. The struggle for the next generation. One of the things I love about ORU and I've, is that whenever Oral Roberts founded the university, a lot of people criticized him, a lot of people had their thoughts, and I'm not saying he did everything perfect, but what that investment has made an impact in generations and in the world. And in our church, we have people that have multiple generations in their family that have now been there and graduated from Earl Roberts University. What we're looking at with Build His Church here on this site and expanding the footprint of North Church and making a difference in Guthrie and, and, and from there on out is not about just building a building. It's about building the church of Jesus Christ. It's about future generations. What we're going to see in building this building is going to be generations that are going to be impacted that we will never actually see for ourselves. Philip went to Caesarea and it's fast forward about 20 years. Pick up in Acts chapter 21 and verse number nine. It says that he had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of, set with me, prophecy. So what, what can we learn about Philip? Is that Philip passed on what he personally experienced. And the challenge for us is how do we continually pass on what we have personally experienced with God? And do we've got a personal encounter with God that the next generation will actually really want to have? Have we encountered God to the level that they say, I want that. I'm going to understand, but I want what mom and dad, I want what my aunt or uncle, I want what my grandma and grandpa, I want what they have. And let me just say this also, young people, some of you can have an experience so real and so powerful that your parents are going to say, I want what my son or my daughter has. Behind me is a picture of Walker Neely. Before Walker was even born, his parents were going to the church here. Before he was born. So he was born here at North Church. Here he is about a year and a half to two years of age. And he sent me this recently. He's one of our interns now here at North Church. And he's also a student at Old Roberts University here out of North Church. And I was meeting with his parents recently and we were talking. And, and then I found out that um, his grandmother... They got generations that go to church here. His grandmother was asking when we're going to have the big announcement. You remember that? And people were like, what is the big announcement? And speculating because we always do that because that's what we do, right? We speculate what it's going to be. And so grandma comes to Walker and says, hey, what is, because she knows that he is here a lot during the day and thinking that he may have overheard something or he has special insights. And she said, is Pastor Rodney resigning? And Walker says, yeah, Pastor Rodney's resigning and he's making me the next pastor of North Church. And his parents were laughing so hard at that 
They said the whole family laughed at that. I told the staff that they laughed hard at that. And I laughed too, but then I also stopped and said, Hey, we can laugh, but we better be very careful because 10 years can change a whole lot of things. 20 years can change a whole lot of things because let me say, this is him right now. And there is going to be some Walker Neely that's going to step in here and lead. They may be a worship leader. They may be the pastor. They may be the worship, the uh, student pastor, but I'm telling you, it's about the next generation. And the next generation is not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter two says in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. This is not a church for somewhere that they cannot be a part of. No, all generations are a part of this church. Behind me, you'll see a picture of scholar Manu. This young girl is anointed. I've seen God's hand on her life. I've seen her walk around as a small child praying for people. This past Sunday, I was down at the altar, and you can see a next picture of her praying over me. And I was in the altar praying, and somebody comes up to me and begins to pray over me. And as they were praying over me, I'm like, who is that? I could feel the anointing of God. I could sense the presence of God. And she began to speak words that I'm thinking, oh my God, that is from you. Because I'm telling you, church, it's not somewhere in the future that these kids are going to be the ones leading us. No, today is the day that they lead us into the future for God. So those are some of the struggles that we're going to face. But how can we thrive through the struggles? Let me break this down. How can we thrive through the struggles? Look at Acts chapter eight and verse four. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. Oh, and I love this because this is what happens when Jesus shows up. So there was great, what? Joy in that city. So how can we thrive? Let me give you four things. One, you gotta obey Jesus. You gotta obey Jesus. My son says to our grandchildren, it says, obedience is success. And it's true. You see, God desires your obedience above everything else. Going all the way back to the garden, you know what he wanted from Adam and Eve? Obedience. You know what he wanted from the first king of Israel? Obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Just obey God. But let me just say, until we get into God's word, we cannot understand what God is saying. Until we get along with God and hear his spirit and put ourselves in positions, we cannot fully grasp what God is speaking to us. Acts chapter eight and verse 26. It says, as Philip, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go down south. He's in Samaria now. And now God says, go down south to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then verse number 27 is key. Read it with me. So he started out. Say that again. So he started out. One more time. So he started out. When God speaks, don't try to figure out and don't try to think about how, how's, what's the next thing. No, just obey what he says. When he says something, just do what he says. And then trust that he will send at the right time the next thing that he wants you to do. Just get started. Just get moving. Just get going. Just obey him and do what he says. And second thing is we got to preach Jesus. So he starts out. And on his road, he gets down to Gaza and he meets the Ethiopian eunuch. Somewhere the Ethiopian eunuch gets a hold of a parchment and he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And he doesn't understand what's going on. And Philip gets up close to him and says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I? Somebody must tell me. And he gets up and he begins to break down the scripture and talk about Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 35. So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about, set with me, Jesus. Come on, I want you to hear me, church. The message that we bring is the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
and him resurrected from the dead. Come on, I want you to hear me. Well, it's so easy to get off on some tangents. It's so easy to get off on your, your, your little silos of what you're getting from social media. Come on, we better be careful to stay focused on Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who came to this earth, who died on a cross, who rose again from the dead, and who is coming back from, for us. And we've got to preach Jesus and him alone. Jesus and him alone. He is the answer for the world because he's the one that delivers. He's the one that saves. He's the one that sets free. He is the hope. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No one else is king. No one else can do what Jesus can do. We have one message and one message only as Jesus. Then also we got to expect the miracles of Jesus. Expect the miracles of Jesus. Earl Roberts would say this, expect a miracle. Jesus said in John 14, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even, say it with me, greater works. The Bible reports miracles, listen to me, but does not prove them except for two. Hear me. Throughout, it just... There was a miracle, it just happened. But God doesn't prove them except for two. You know those two miracles that God proves? One is the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it is central to everything. He didn't have to prove the virgin birth. He didn't have to prove the water into wine. He didn't have to prove all the miracles. What he did prove was the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, to literally thousands of people. He would make it very clear so that the world would have that foundational knowledge so that what happens is now because the resurrection is real, I can believe everything else that Jesus did as real. Does that make sense? And then the second thing that he proves is a life that has been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. You know what you are? You're proof of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Every day when you walk in the fruit of the Spirit, every day when you stand for Christ Jesus, every day when people look and say, no, 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 there is proof that there is a Lord and that he rose from the dead because I see it in him. I see it in her. I see it in those people. Come on, may we be those people that are living proof of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the last one. We got to disciple people in Jesus. Disciple people in Jesus. If you go back and look at the scripture, in the book of Acts chapter eight, where Stephen goes to Samaria, he preaches the word, the miracles happen, they believe. What's the next thing that happens? They're baptized in water. And then Peter and John come and they're baptized in the spirit. Here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the thing. There's a progressive part of being a disciple. It's not like you check one box and you're done. I, I made this statement a couple of weeks ago is that you have not met all of God yet. You follow me? None of you have. I don't care how big your experience and powerful your experience is. There is more of God waiting for you. And what we have to do is put ourselves in a position so that we can daily experience more of God in our life. That is in his word. That is with the people of God, and that is with the Spirit of God. We position ourselves for that. And let me also warn us not to be so quick to pass judgment on others that are just getting started or investigating this journey. Now, the Bible, we, we can use that scripture, judge not lest you be judged. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the rest of that is, but with the same measure you judge, it will be judged back to you. And the Bible says that the righteous will judge the world. And so there is a place and time that the righteous, the followers of Christ, have to make judgment calls, have to make decisions. You understand that? But our first role as followers of Jesus Christ is to become fishers of men and women. To present the gospel with them and invite them on the journey and see that they come to know Jesus Christ. There's a story in here, Simon who is a sorcerer, who sees Philip working in the miracles. He chooses to believe. He is baptized. Later on, Peter and John come, and then there's the gifts of the Spirit that are operating. He's like, oh, I want that. Give me, I'll, I'll pay you for that so that I can. And then Peter and I was like, no, 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 you can't buy this. You're going to be judged for your wrongful motives. 
And see, there may be people that are in this business and showing up here for the wrong motives because they wanna be in with the in crowd or hanging out, but it's not our job to figure that. In time, they will reveal their colors. But through the process, may we be people that catch us fish and bring them in, and let's let Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit clean the fish for us, amen? Oh, somebody say amen to that. God's good, isn't he? Jesus is on the throne. He is on the throne. I want us to stand, Guthrie in Oklahoma City. Let's pray. Our prayer team is gonna be available in Guthrie in Oklahoma City. Let's talk to God right now. Let's let God work in our hearts and lives. Don't set back. Let God go deep inside of you. You have not met all of God yet. If you need Christ, call out to Him. And then what do you do? It's water baptism. Father, I pray right now by your spirit, you touch our hearts, may we take your word and actually do something with it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.